so uh, hi uh, everyone uh, and thanks for uh, joining us for this third talk uh, in the ongoing C conversation series uh, which is called to inhabit uh, with care uh, i'm prasad khanulkar and i teach as a assistant professor at the school of environment and architecture uh, this series, uh, which is called Sea Conversations, uh, is organized by Sea City, uh, which is an uh, institutional extension of the School of Environment and Architecture. Uh, so it's sort of an institutional appendage, uh, which was you know, conceived as a public platform uh, for generating dialogue on architectural, social, uh, and cultural issues, uh, particularly uh, pertaining to spatial environments that we produce and inhabit. Uh, so the C Conversation series, uh, which is a fortnightly series uh, and is curated every semester, uh, is also partially funded by the Urban Center in Mumbai, uh, which is a node for dialogue and ideation uh, to carry out research in sustainable urban development. Uh, so, it, you know, the idea be behind C Conversations was that we sort of uh, curate every semester uh, a series of lectures or talks or conversations around a particular theme, uh, which has uh, some sense of urgency in the contemporary context. Uh, it requires uh, some kind of an interrogation, but also fleshing out, uh, but in conversation with others. Right. Uh, so this year, the series is anchored around the theme of care, uh, and it's particularly located in today's uh, planetary context, uh, where everything seems uncertain, you know, in terms of uh, the challenges of climate change, uh, in terms of a certain erasure of social security systems, uh, in terms of the recurrent pandemics, uh, there's an increasing sense of you know, xenophobia, uh, but also certain financialization of lives, uh, where the term care itself today has you know, connotes two things. One is sort of this notion of uh, financial care, which is provided by the health insurance systems, uh, or a certain idea of a clinical care, which is a very medicalized term, right? Uh, and so th for us, uh, the interrogation was, is there a way, uh, or how do we rethink care today, right? Uh, and how do we rethink care, uh, not just in terms of as a concept, but the kind of relationships we build with each other or the way in which we engage with others. Uh, so for today, uh, so this is the third talk in the series. Uh, and today we're joined by LK Krasny. Uh, so welcome, uh, LK. Uh, LK is a professor for art and education at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. Uh, she is a feminist culture theorist, uh, an urban researcher, a curator, and an author. Uh, as I was just reading about her work, you know, I just figured you have three books coming out this year itself. Uh, uh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so her earlier work, uh, so she's authored and co-edited a number of books, uh, you know, uh, the, the more prominent one being uh, Critical Care, Architecture and Urbanism for a Broken Planet, which was published in 2019 by MIT Press, uh, Radicalizing Care, uh, Feminist and Queer Activism and Curating. And this year itself, uh, she has actually four more books coming out, which is one is on living with an inf infected planet on uh, COVID feminism and the global frontline of care, a book on Yasmin Lari, uh, by, again by MIT Press, on curating with care with Lara Perry, uh, and on curating as feminist organizing, uh, again with uh, Lara Perry, uh, who's her co-editor and co-author. Uh, her curatorial work has also been exhibited in a range of prominent venues, uh, and it's a long list, some of which include the Architecture Center, Vienna, the, v the Venice Biennale, uh, the Center for Design in Montreal, uh, Museum for Contemporary Art in Leipzig. Uh, but what sort of runs through her scholarship and which is what interested us uh, was 
that her work uh, in terms of academic writings, curatorial work and international lectures, uh, they all address questions of care uh, at the present historical juncture uh, with a specific focus on the emancipatory and transformative practices uh, in these different fields, which is art, curation, architecture and urbanism. Uh, so it's, without uh, taking too much of time, I'll hand it over to LK. Uh, LK, welcome. Uh, so the format is, uh, you know, where you will give present a talk uh, and which will followed up by you know conversations uh, with the faculty at C and as well as a Q and A with the larger audience who's with us. Yeah. Uh, so for those of you who you are attending, if you have questions, do post them uh, in the chat box. Yeah. So I'll hand it over to you, LK. Welcome again. Well, good afternoon to, to everybody, and uh, thank you so much for this really kind uh, introduction that, that also named all the books that have come out this year. And thank you to C-City um, and C-Conversations for having me as one of the people who give a lecture in this series of conversations dedicated to thinking about care um, at a historical <clears throat> moment, historical conjuncture we find ourselves in today, which was already um, very succinctly um, described in the introductory words. Um, so today I want to um, think uh, in this lecture about what it means to be living with a wounded planet and, uh, and how we could imagine um, building recovery and I think of recovery as a very specific form um, of care with recovery, a word being used both after times of war, but also um, after people have uh, been ill. So I think it's a very apt word to think about our current moment um, of acute wars and pandemic and pandemics, but also the, the, long, um, the long moment um, of um, colonial patriarchal um, aftermath and violence that defines um, our world today. I want to start with uh, a quote by Valida Imarisha. She's an educator, writer, spoken word artist and activist. And she has stated that we can't build what we can't imagine. So in order to build a different world, and building includes architecture, but can also be understood in more metaphorical terms, we have to become able to, to imagine this kind of building differently. And I think this is where our huge um, collective task today lies, how to imagine different worldings so that we can inhabit in order to care as this lecture series um, instructs us to. How can we imagine architecture and building in order to learn how to live differently with a wounded planet? So I have chosen to say living with a planet and not living on a planet. And I think it's quite obvious that um, the, the different um, um, position that is being indicated by with and indicated by on has a lot to do with what we already heard about the relationships we build with each other. So living with a wounded planet means that we have a relationship with a wounded planet and not living on an object that uh, has been harmed and violated and wounded. And I think the living on has been part of this um, uh, process of wounding that has a lot to do with um, hegemonic um, imaginaries, uh, modern hegemonic imaginaries. How can we learn then to imagine and to build recovery in order to recover from the ongoingness of patriarchal colonial capitalist violence? The first part um, of the lecture will look at what, what I think about when I say living with a wounded planet. 
And the, the two second parts will look at um, infrastructural consciousness raising and um, building. Um, the second and the third part will look at infrastructural consciousness raising and um, the third part then on building recovery. So the wounded planet um, is the, the cause. Um, the cause behind the wounded planet uh, is modern capitalist, colonial, imperial, patriarchal, uh, regimes that that have harmed um, this place that we inhabit as human beings together with many other um, sentient beings. And uh, the world these regimes have built have profoundly wounded the planet. Um, I think that the following um, quote by W.E.B. Dubas um, that Elizabeth Povinelli quotes and refers to in her book, Geontologies, A Requiem to Late Liberalism, uh, captures how the colonial regimes um, are inside the built environments that we inhabit and uh, use and that infrastructuralize our lives. The quote reads as follows, the material and discursive origins of European monumentalism, such as the gleaming boulevards of Brussels, were found in the brutal colonial regimes of the Congo. So what this quote uh, makes us aware of is how the materiality of the built environments um, relies on resource imaginaries and uh, material production that was very much uh, shaped and defined uh, by colonial imperial regimes. And that here and there, in this case, Brussels and the Congo are most deeply connected with each other and entangled in each other. The following slides show a number of books uh, that have been all been published in the 21st century and um, in a way raise awareness uh, for the condition of colonial patriarchal violence that has wounded the planet and also make us aware that there is new scholarship in architecture and architectural histories and um, urban studies and urban histories that um, look succinctly and sharply at the conditions that have uh, been produced in the past that we inherited and uh, that still um, shape and define um, living today. So what, what you're looking at now is White Papers, Black Marks, Architecture, Race, Culture by Leslie Loco uh, and Race and Modern Architecture, Critical History from the Enlightenment to the Present, edited by Cheng Davis II uh, and Wilson. Um, then two books um, out of a wide range of books that deal uh, with um, sexism uh, and uh, the consequences of uh, patriarchal urban planning um, today. The first one you see is Why Loiter, Women and Risk on Mumbai Streets, and the second one, The Feminist City, is an ongoing experiment in living differently, living better, and living more justly in an urban world. Um, feminist city. The third slide um, shows two books um, that um, deal concretely with uh, architecture that uh, seeks to provide care on one hand in the book Critical Care, Architecture and Urbanism for a Broken Planet that Angelica Fitz and myself co-edited and um, Material Cultures, Material Reform, um, wrote and edited a book uh, that looks at how materials have to be understood and used differently in order to build um, a post-carbon future. So, so this is a, a small library out of a much larger library, but I think it, it also shows us that books that do not necessarily have the term care in the title are important in order to understand both historical care violence and practicing care uh, through the built environment and architecture and infrastructure differently today. Value systems of hierarchies and the economic imperative of extraction, exploitation and exhaustion have wounded the planet and the planet's beings. So what I want to underline here is that um, 
we as human beings are just um, one species about among many other different planetary beings and we are with the planet so so the wounding refers not just to the the planet as a geological entity but the planet as all those who live um, with this planet um, together with this planet the modern colonial patriarchal world the aftermath of which we inhabit today was built on ideas of hierarchies lending legitimacy to domination and exploitation. So we could also call this the aftermath of, of enlightenment as many other scholars have done. The violence of sexism, speciesism and racism has resulted from these, these hierarchies and is part of um, the, the aftermath that, that we have inherited today and seek to resist against um, and learn um, relearn and imagine differently. The planet is deeply wounded. The ideology of human supremacy, as the term Anthropocene suggests, has turned human impact on the planet into the reason behind the climate catast catastrophe and the ongoing mass extinction. The geological force of humans is causing the planet's wounds. The built environment generates 40% of annual global CO2 emissions. Of those total emissions, building operations are responsible for 27% annually, while building and infrastructure materials and construction, typically referred to as embodied carbon, are responsible for an additional 30% annually. Uh, this was published on Architecture 2030 org. And I think this is one of the, it's maybe not the only reason, but it's one of the main reasons why architecture um, has to think differently about care when it comes to planetary care and how architecture, which uh, is part of the built environment and shapes um, imaginaries of what the built environment is, can do and performs has to become a form of planetary care that is uh, has to stop generating 40% of annual global CO2 emissions. So, so that's one dimension of, of why care and architecture have to be brought together at the scale of the planetary. But I think we also have to think um, at the scale of um, human lives and architecture as a support system that brings uh, support um, to human life on a daily basis for having a home, dwelling, uh, daily social reproduction, et cetera, et cetera. Working toward a different way of living with a wounded planet includes learning, understanding, and acting upon the care needs of the planet. And this requires imagining different politics and economies and different ways of building. It imagines, it requires us to, to ask questions like, how do we relate to the wounded planet? How do we as human beings build these relationships? And, and these might be easy questions for some, but difficult questions for others who are maybe less used to think in these terms and, and also less used to bringing them to architecture and to built environment. So to say this more directly, um, the developers, um, capital centric uh, developers and speculation uh, driven urban development uh, does not think in imaginaries of relating to the wounded planet differently. And the second question I would like to pose and raise here is how do we move from wounding to healing? So how can architecture and building move from wounding the planet to actually caretaking um, and healing the, the planet's wounds. The care needs of the planet are, as we all know, um, at the same time, human care needs. Humans inhabit their planet. They are most intimately connected to and constituted by the planet as they breathe in the planet's air, drink the planet's water, eat what grows on the planet's earth. Um, but uh, the, the legacies of um, modern thinking has separated 
many human beings from thinking this way and um, constituted um, strands uh, of thought that have told human beings that they are independent rather than they are interdependent um, with um, all these other entities and other beings um, with whom they are interconnected through air, water, earth, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so to, in a way, oppose um, or make more apparent the, the contradiction um, between architecture as a form of care and architecture as um, a commodity and a form of speculation and investment, I have put these two uh, quotes together here. Angelika Fitz and myself wrote in 2019 that architecture provides a primary form of care. Peggy Diemer in 2014 has written that the history of architecture is the history of capital. And I think it's precisely uh, in the space between those two statements that, that are both um, um, factual. So architecture provides a primary form of care. And factually, the history of architecture is the history of capital that um, we have to reimagine, um, relearn, maybe retrain um, what building architecture uh, in a different way for healing a wounded planet can and will be. The second part of this lecture um, builds on an essay that I wrote um, last year. And um, this essay is actually called uh, Living with a Wounded Planet, Infrastructural Consciousness Raising. And I want to share uh, my thoughts on this practice of infrastructural consciousness raising that I suggested there and that I have meanwhile practiced in in teaching and, and workshops and gatherings um, together with others uh, in order to propose one uh, practical way how in teaching and, and also in everyday life, together with others, we can uh, learn by storytelling and sharing with each other how we actually understand um, infrastructures and architecture as a form of care, as a form of infrastructure, and how we can make um, more heard the invisibilized um, care, but also the invisibilized violence um, of um, infrastructures. We can say that modern infrastructure is wounding the planet, but at the same time, infrastructure is and provides essential care. Infrastructure, including architecture, is needed to support and maintain human life. Um, the following quote by Lilian Kroth, Infrastructure Translation and Metaphor, is the essay in which she uh, quoted Keller Easterling, uh, kind of succinctly sums up uh, how Keller Easterling, in her book Extra Statecraft, has seen uh, and defined infrastructure and why it's important to think about infrastructure when we think about uh, interdependencies and also care and wounding. Keller Easterling sees in infrastructure the hidden point of contact and access between all of us. So infrastructure is very much um, a relationship. Um, and um, infrastructure is a collective term for the rules governing the space of everyday life. And if we understand that architecture, uh, in particularly housing, um, architecture for working, architecture um, that um, provides healthcare, that provides educational spaces, uh, that provides um, all kinds of welfare, uh, is also a kind of infrastructure and therefore a collective term for the rules governing the space of everyday life. And I want to bring to the space of everyday life um, this interconnectedness and these relationships, um, the practice of consciousness raising. Consciousness raising is a historical form of feminist activism that was developed in the late 1960s. Groups of people get together, often in someone's home, to work out through personal experience, memories, and knowledge, a system or a structural condition. 
common issues and common concerns are found by way of sharing stories that become the basis of analysis of societal, economic, health, family, or political conditions. And, and what I propose in the essay and what I've also been practicing, as I said before, in, in workshops together with others, is how infrastructure as a common issue and common concern um, could be shared through um, storytelling and speaking. But I also learned in these uh, first um, workshops that I've done, and I plan to continue that in the future, that it is not um, very easy to share infrastructural stories, that we actually um, lack a language around infrastructure and a language around infrastructure um, as care. Um, and a, a language uh, also needs to be more nuancedly developed around infrastructure as a form of wounding. Um, this is the book word um, essay that I wrote was uh, included in. The book's title is Broken Relations, Infrastructure, Aesthetics, and Critique. And uh, this essay, um, um, as I quote here, argues that we need to collectively raise awareness of the modern infrastructural condition, which affects both individual lives and the planet as a whole. This essay situates infrastructure at the crucial intersection of social and environmental justice and proposes a better understanding of how the connectivity engendered by infrastructure affects everyone and everything and further gives rise to socio-environmental and biomaterial interdependencies and responsibilities. Okay, just a second. My screen seems to be um, frozen. Sure, take it. Yeah, okay. Um, now it works again. I apologize for this uh, short interruption. Um, in order to build new forms of infrastructural activism and care, we collectively need to share stories illuminating the structural and systemic dimensions of infrastructural discrimination and violence against human life and nature. Moreover, the feminist multidimensional dimensional approach might give new insight into how structural conditions affect individual lives in different ways. The infrastructural condition has to be studied with historic and geographic specificity and understood in intersectional terms, taking factors such as cl class, ethnicity, race, sexual orientation, ability, and age into consideration. So what I wrote here in this text was in a way um, prefigurative writing or pro propositional writing. So thinking about something that can be useful uh, to be done um, both in scholarship um, and in teaching, uh, but also in, in practicing, um, imagining, building, and inhabiting differently um, together with others. So I hope I got it unstuck again. Um, the dependency uh, of uh, human creatures on sustaining and supporting infrastructural life shows that the organization of infrastructure is intimately tied with an enduring sense of individual life. How life is endured and with what degree of suffering, livability, or hope. Um, Judith Butler wrote that a number of years ago in her book Notes Toward the Performative Theory of Assembly. And her um, thinking about infrastructure has been um, very important to, to many in advancing uh, their ways of imagining um, infrastructure differently, but also understanding um, how individual 
and collective uh, lives and interdependencies are constituted by infrastructure. So we could say that the lack of infrastructure is actually a form of care violence or that the non-maintenance of infrastructure, the, the degradation of infrastructure, the unavailability of access to infrastructure is a form of uh, structural and systemic um, care violence. And I think uh, this is where a lot of uh, future making and future oriented uh, work that um, is um, concerned with uh, healing um, what the past has wounded is concerned today. And the second uh, thinker that I, I want to bring um, in here in order to make understood um, whose thinking has um, provided um, profound um, and um, very nuanced ways of approaching both infrastructure and storytelling is a, is a quote by Donna Haraway uh, that she wrote in the book, Staying with the Trouble. It matters what matters we use to think other matters with, Haraway wrote. It matters what stories we uh, tell to tell other stories with. It matters what knots, not knots, what thoughts think thoughts, what descriptions describe descriptions, what ties tie ties. It matters what stories make worlds, what worlds make stories. And I think um, if we build on her, we can understand that it matters uh, what stories uh, make infrastructures and uh, what infrastructures make stories. Infrastructural consciousness raising for different architectural histories and for working toward infrastructural ethics in architecture is therefore a proposition um, I want to make. And uh, I'm sharing very few examples um, how we could approach such um, architectural histories uh, through the lens of infrastructure, wounding um, infrastructural. Uh, wounding as care violence, etc. Um, so the image you're looking at is um, Grenfell Towers, the, the public housing in London after it burned uh, in 2017. And uh, this was caused by structural uh, neglect, by neglect of maintenance. and by something that had been well known. So the, the neglect was not um, a neglect uh, caused by ignorance, but uh, a neglect caused by ignoring uh, what was known. In her book, um, Urban Warfare, Housing Under the Empire of Finance, Raquel Rornick uh, examines uh, the reasons behind such developments and uh, she was also the, the UN Special Rapporteur um, on the violation of human rights uh, through uh, this housing violence who came to um, inspect Grenfell Towers um, in London. The second example I want to give here um, is an example that has to do with um, climate catastrophe and climate refugees in Bangladesh. Um, referring to the internal uh, displacement because of flood inundation that uh, makes a lot of uh, particularly female uh, people migrate uh, internally and uh, become workers in uh, the globalized uh, textile industry. And this photograph shows, or these two photographs show the collapse of Rana Plaza in the Dhaka district in Bangladesh. And all these images um, tell us that these are actually architectural histories and that we could, uh, when we teach architectural history and share histories about architecture and infrastructure, we can use examples like these in order to um, study, analyze, discuss, and of course, uh, transform and change the policies and uh, politics around infrastructure. In her book, How Women Can Save the Planet, Anne Karp um, has a chapter that deals with uh, Rana Plaza and its collapse, and that highlights uh, the um, climate conditions um, behind um, the moving of women from the villages uh, to the textile industry. 
So infrastructural consciousness raising um, can be done in relation to both biopolitics and um, necropolitics, uh, to use the terms of Michel Foucault and Achille Membe here. Today, um, in a lot of scholarship and, and, and teaching in universities, there remains a perceived split or competition between social and environmental concerns, those involving human rights and infrastructure and the right of nature to be protected from infrastructural harm. Thinking and feeling with infrastructure beyond the anthropocentric norm and anthropogenic perception of supremacy over nature demands access to more complex and detailed stories, including ones told from the perspectives of the air, water, earth, lead, boxed, oil, birds, trees, wetlands, grass, children, and the elderly, to name but a few perspectives from which such stories could be told and imagined and shared. The next two slides um, show two quotes by um, Judith Butler um, that uh, make even clearer the dimension of infrastructural violence and infrastructural deadliness. Who dies early and why and for whom is there no infrastructural or social promise of life's um, continuity? So here Butler makes very clear um, the classed um, and racialized and um, sexualized conditions uh, of um, infrastructural violence or access um, to good um, infrastructure. And the next uh, quote by her also can be read uh, through a lens of um, the rights uh, of nature and not human rights to nature. And yet an inhabitable world for humans depends on a flourishing earth that doesn't have humans at its center. We oppose environmental toxins, not only so that we humans can live and breathe without fear of being poisoned, but also because the water and the air must have lives that are not centered on our own. So what's, what Butler suggests here, and what I think is very important um, to imagining architecture and, and the built environment differently, is that water and air must have lives um, that are not centered um, on human life. So we can, uh, using uh, thoughts like uh, the before mentioned, um, and um, at the same time, infrastructural uh, storytelling rooted in the everyday in order to build infrastructural ethics in relation to the rights of humans and the rights of nature. And this um, can uh, become part of working towards a multi-species and environmental understanding of infrastructural ethics in architectural practice and in architectural histories. The third part, um, the third and last part of this lecture uh, looks at um, what I have called building recovery. Um, and I will first introduce the term um, recovery, and then I will um, share one example um, by artist Julia Strauss uh, in Athens, uh, the Autonomy Academia that takes place in an outdoor space in Plato's garden in order to speak about um, a non-violent practice of architecture and a very violent practice of architecture as it is connected with this uh, specific site um, that has a very long um, history and, and occupies a very important uh, place in Western uh, philosophical imaginaries. Um, building joins matter and meaning in the words of the theoretical physicist and feminist theorist Karen Barad. Building ties most firmly what the feminist epistemologist and historian of science Donna Haraway has called material semiotic nodes or knots. Building materializes meaning. So the interest in building here has to do with that building is um, very much material, spatial, um, being inhabited, um, exists in the so-called one-to-one scale in the real world. 
but at the same time, um, building always materializes meaning, gives shape to cultural, um, social, and societal, um, political, environmental, ecological, even spiritual and, and religious uh, meaning making. So, so building, as um, stated in, in the first line here, profoundly joins together meta and meaning. This is why it's so important to, to um, relearn um, how to build and to imagine building differently um, for producing futurity and um, future making. In, in the book, uh, Living with an Infected Planet, COVID-19, Feminism and the Global Frontline of Care, I examined um, in the third chapter of this book, uh, Feminist Recovery Plans. Uh, during the pandemic, um, in after the World Health Organization had officially declared the outbreak of the pandemic, uh, on March 11 in 2020, um, soon after feminist policymakers together with health practitioners, activists, uh, researchers and scholars in different parts of the world, like in Hawaii, um, in Canada, a network of African economists, um, but also at the level of UN women, started to craft and write uh, recovery plans collectively. And uh, these recovery plans actually centered around care and uh, imagined uh, different um, economies and ecologies that would have care at their center for future preparedness um, for pandemics and uh, climate catastrophic um, events. And uh, the word um, recovery is, uh, as I said earlier, a very interesting word because it's um, used for individual recovery um, after an illness or a sickness. After a person has been ill or wounded, this person is recovering. And when we are in recovery, we are in a very specific state. Our, our bodies, our minds, our spirits, our hearts are maybe more vulnerable, are frail, are, are not quite as we have been before. And also, we never know if after so-called recovery, we'll, we will be the way we were before, or if we will be different. I mean, we may have recovered, but still our bodies, our minds, our feelings, our hearts, our spirits may have um, changed. So this is important when we think about recovery, and recovery very much hinges on receiving care. Um, care by others, care by infrastructures, but also um, self-care. But then of course, as we all know, recovery is also used um, at, um, at the global um, level or at the nation state level or at the planetary level. And it's particularly used um, after war. So, so when um, entire societies and, and states are being rebuilt, after war, not 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 just uh, physically and materially rebuilt, but also um, rebuilt through education and um, ideological re-education. Um, the term recovery and recovery plan is also very often um, used. So, so I want to emphasize and underline this very broad understanding of recovery, um, which in a way informed uh, my writing in this book but also my examination of these feminist recovery plans. Feminist recovery as policy notion um, was developed in horizontal and transversal forms of writing together with members of feminist grassroots and civil society groups, activists and researchers. And I think that this is a very um, important and relevant model to understand how policy is, has been, and can be a, a territory um, of emancipatory, emancipating activist practice in order to um, change the conditions um, of making. And also, of course, this can, will, has been, and could be um, a field of um, architectural um, activism and involvement in order to reshape um, the, the conditions, um, the, 
the laws and, and legal frameworks and legal imaginaries around building in order to push back against the atrocities and the violence uh, of capitalist, um, of rapid uh, capitalist um, destruction through uh, building uh, and construction. Therefore, planning for a feminist recovery uh, needs to stay attuned to such long-term processes of recovery, which, which I spoke about before in, in more personal terms of the individual, uh, which above all require the responsiveness of care. And in order to be responsive, we, we actually need to understand what someone needs. I mean, we all know that from personal experience, that it's sometimes not so easy to find out what another person needs, what another being needs, or what even we, we ourselves need. So finding out um, what exactly the planet needs is, is a complex um, collective task that, that we are involved in. To imagine this, one may think of questions like the following. What does the infected planet beyond the acute disease of the current pandemic need to recover from? What does the infected planet need in order for recovering and healing to take place? When will the planet have been enabled to recover? One can declare the end of wars or pandemics, but one can never declare the end of recovery. One can never be really certain that recovery or healing are complete. And this is also why we may think of uh, caring for recovery as a an unending um, and ongoing, a permanent uh, process and uh, work um, that uh, lies in the present, but also ahead of us. Taking the notion of feminist recovery to refer to the recovery from the lasting aftermath of ideological and material patriarchal warfare on bodies, minds, and environments, and the historical violence of patriarchy, which has led to the production of gendered, sexualized, racialized, and classed vulnerable populations, and the large-scale ruination of their habitats and environments, makes such feminist recovery, as I said before, never-ending. Perhaps there will have to be permanent feminist recovery. And now I will share with you um, um, a long-term durational ongoing project that um, the artist and activist Julia Strauss uh, has been um, producing, imagining, um, organizing, and insisting on since 2014 called Autonomy Academia Autonomous Academy. Uh, and I'm quoting here from a text by, by Julia, Autonomy Academia, Curating Becomes Curing, which uh, is included in, in the, the book um, Curating with Care, which I co-edited co -edited with Lara Perry. Autonomy Academia is a self-organized grassroots university as a durational artwork. This university takes place in the garden in Athens where Plato taught the Acad Academia Platonos. Originally, this academy was a military gymnasium and Plato was invited to join it to broaden the horizons of the male warriors. Training the youth into a condition of serving the militarized state is the oldest, most continuous European dispositive, as Julia Strauss writes. Um, this is, as she states, what Autonomy Academia rewrites. Our dispositive is gentle, kind, and lush. Autonomy Academia writes a new Politeia without Plato. So I've also chosen this, this case study or example here because it has to do with the title of the lecture series, to inhabit, so, so not to give up spaces that were marked by um, patriarchal philosophy and violence in the past, but actually to use them and inhabit, uh, inhabit them differently and with the same intention of having a self-organized university that was the intention 2000 years ago. So I'm continuing the quote. Uh, it overrides the existing Politeia as a siren would the Odyssey. It celebrates the garden's very existence as a public space, as a commons throughout millennia, thanks to the communities that have been living with this garden and protecting it down the generations um, for more than 2000 years now. The culture of this garden, 
as Julia Strauss emphasizes, is the root of the Anthropocene. Plato's Politeia, translated to English as the Republic, has preconditioned the empire at war with nature, where we still live. Um, what follows shows um, a few images of gatherings um, in this garden in, in the last years. And also the image um, taken by Clara Mosconi, um, the year Autonomy Academia focused on eco-feminist feminist practices uh, that Julia Strauss kindly um, allowed me to use for announcing this lecture today. So I want to uh, argue that recovery can also be protesting against violent forms of building. A few years ago, Black Rock, um, this um, international um, global um, planetary um, destructive um, investor, uh, planned to build a mall there called Academy Gardens Mall, um, which uh, activism stopped in 2018. So also this could be um, a story to be included in architectural histories, um, talking about um, the ways in, in which uh, architectural violence has been prevented through uh, public protest. Currently, there, there is new pressure um, on the park um, as um, Greece uh, built plans to build um, a new archaeological museum um, at the Plato Academy Park. And the winner of the architectural competition um, was announced in early 2023. So I think there are many discussions to be had uh, about the involvement and entanglement of architectural uh, product production. Um, the partaking in, in competitions, um, the being at the service um, of um, neoliberal capitalist um, building and construction industry, and how architecture schools and um, education and um, activism within education can um, provide the tools in, in order to um, imagine building differently and to resist uh, capital-centric um, building invitations via competition or um, direct invitation. In a recent conversation via email with the Mexican architect Tatiana Bilbao, um, we were thinking about how architecture has to be uh, a form of care for rebuilding um, our lives and rebuilding our lives um, collectively. So I want to suggest that um, rebuilding Plato Academy Park is a form of care. And in a workshop that took um, place there in June, which I participated in, uh, we focused on imagining uh, different futures uh, for the park. Uh, that would include the rights of humans and the rights of nature and the care needs of humans who are now using uh, the park, uh, not um, globalized uh, mass tourism, and the care needs of the trees that are now there and that uh, will be cut if the museum will be built. And these public imaginaries um, voiced in a collective thinking session, in a collective workshop during Autonomy Academia 2023 included uncovering the river that runs under the park and is completely invisible today. Also adding public toilets, which would make using the, the park for many people much easier and also much safer. And also using the park for all kinds of forms of um, public education at a time when education is also being turned into a globalized um, commodity. And this, of course, has led to, to other and new forms of universities uh, pushing back against that. And I want to conclude um, with the following statement. Um, I'm writing with hope that imagining building otherwise can lead to understanding the future as caring with the wounded planet.
Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Uh, thanks so much, LK, for the, the wonderful talk. Uh, so <clears throat> maybe I'll start off. Uh, we actually already have uh, questions that are lined up. Uh, Joel, can you actually? Uh, uh, okay. So uh, uh, you want me to bring them in? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Julia Strauss, I think. Yeah, uh, if she is. So, I mean, since you were talking about so, so she was the first one who posted a question. So, I'll, you know. Uh, uh, okay, I've invited. Yeah, okay. Uh, Julia, if you don't mind, you can join into the conversation. Uh, so, uh, let me just, you know, uh, maybe start. Uh, I mean, you, uh, uh, there's a survey in which you sort of outline uh, the work that you're doing, uh, and there's certain uh, you know conceptual terms, but which are also really you know uh, very uh, affective, very sort of real processes that you're talking about. You know, uh, particularly uh, this idea of healing, right? Uh, and I was wondering if you could speak. Uh, uh, particularly for, uh, you know, sometimes for architects who, you know, because we've understood healing uh, as this, uh, I mean, you do speak about the idea of raising consciousness as one part of it, uh, but healing from woundedness requires a very different kind of a process uh, in terms of, uh, you know, psychological uh, ideas. So what does healing look like in architectural terms is something that I would you know, uh, ask firstly. I mean, I think the it, this is a hugely complex question. So thank you for sure. yeah. so so I just looked at the chat um and where you um also published that there is uh, the book first questions that the School of Environment and Architect right. has published. And and so I think um so providing and constituting together with one students a different way of edu educating ourselves what architecture is and can do, I think is a first step toward what, what I called healing. I mean, so to, to understand that there is actually a lot of violence um, that architecture has committed, let's say, okay. as, as a crime um, against nature when it comes to the um, cement industry. Um, so, so my mother language is German. So we have like an expression of um, concrete gold. So, so, so that concrete uh, or cement is the new kind of gold from which uh, money can be made or extracted. Yeah. So, so understanding um, how materials um, used in building and how the construction industry is actually. Um, causing violence and destruction for which I use the term wounding, um, hmm. I think that would be one first step. But I think what Angelica and myself tried to do or did in, in the book, Critical Care, um, Architecture and Urbanism for a Broken Planet, is uh, bring together and, 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 and gather um, case studies of, of built examples of architecture that works differently. And I think this is just as important as analyzing, um, let's say, what has been going wrong, we also need to have a very strong um, analysis of, of good examples um, in order to, to use them vis-a-vis -vis politicians, vis-a-vis -vis developers, vis-a-vis -vis students um, to, to practice um, architecture that can become a form of healing. And when I talk about healing here, I mean, um, the, the ways in which the climate catastrophe is being caused um, by um, architecture. I know I'm taking very long. I just want to add no, that's right. okay. one little thing. Sorry, sorry, too sure. long. Um, so I also think that buildings uh, in the past, when we look at them from an intersectional perspective, um, are performing a lot of, of, of violence in expecting specific ways of movement, of bodily orientations, how they have to be used and inhabited. So in the part of the world where I live in Europe, there's a lot of talk at the moment that we should stop building altogether. So the solution would be no more building. 
And while I agree with this in, in cities that are densely built up and very infrastructuralized, like Vienna, where I live, I do not agree with this for many parts of the world where a lot of infrastructure is lacking. But I also think that a lot of the, the buildings that are already here mm. haven't been very friendly to many bodies. Um, they, they, they have been very classed. Um, they have been... Um, very normative and in a way also, let's say, violent in that way. So, so I would say working carefully with the existing and making it more caring and um, in an intersectional way, that's a huge task for many architects and, and very physical and concrete. So I'm not talking about this in metaphorical terms, maybe right. that, that was misunderstood in the language I'm using. Uh, thanks. Uh, Julia, did you want to ask your question? Um, I just wanted to ask what is the next step? And I know that it is a very tough and far too straight to frontal question. But uh, the next step after raising awareness about all our local struggles, the next step after we have created the legal rights based on our local relations to the natural phenomena we are um, in symbiosis with, or we are trying to prevent ecocide of. The next step um, is some universal law. The next step is some, some conjoint legislation uh, some kind of alternative um, legislative agenda? Where can it be introduced to? I'm very sorry if I'm oriented towards direct effects of such a conference uh, as this one, but yeah, I'm also interested how this very gathering can be um, as a conclusion of what you, Elke, just said. Um, can start, how can it start a certain conjoint healing process? This question was already too long, so I'm not adding <laughs> elements to this question, sorry. Uh, maybe you can start adding some answers. <laughs> Um, I can't add the answers. I just really felt that it might lead to an inspiration of conclusions that could eventually, yes, so something can follow out of what you just said because um, what you just said uh, is very empowering because you were talking about storytelling and about sharing you know, information about environmental destruction that is happening and raising awareness and also something that actually shift, shifts our understanding, shifts our consciousness for what architecture needs, for instance. And we struggling on the ground, we don't see what we do anymore. We just think this is hopeless because the um, plans are still there. We, we are struggling in raising the consciousness, we are telling the stories, but there is still the threat. So there is no direct effect. This is why to hear that already to do this is very important. So um, to, to really voice this uh, call for globalized commodity of education, for instance, this is already important. But I just wonder, you know, yesterday we had a meeting with the Sabatistas and uh, they told us about their struggles 
And you know, it's it's really devastating. It's de devastating that we all exchange our devastating stories about our struggles, but what is the next step? What can happen as a result of, of this gathering, for example? What are the effective strategies we can draw from the fact of gatherings? I don't have an answer, no, I'm asking. I'll invite uh, my colleague uh, Rohit to uh, join the conversation. I mean, he's been looking uh, on the area for a while now. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks, Prasad. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, thanks, Prasad. Uh, thanks, LK, for your talk. Um, I mean, um, the idea of wounding and healing as two different as as two analogies or as two concepts uh, one trying to kind of you know um, engage in um, uh, you know opposition to the other so if we wounded the world then we need to find heal it and I mean that's a very powerful uh, uh, provocation now uh, you know when I'm kind of talking it's like when we start uh, actually engaging with them on different kinds of grounds in different geographies, different different social or economic conditions in the world, um, I mean, just kind of fieldwork teaches you. I mean, like I'm just speaking from fieldwork experience of doing this work is that it's very difficult to mobilize. Uh, an oppositional concept in a mirror image of what is being opposed, and that 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 becomes a uh, uh, that becomes a very uh, uh, critical point because the moment you mobilize it as an oppos in a in a mirror image of what is being opposed, we tend to notice that the claims of those whom you are trying to engage or kind of support via these issues um actually you are kind of weakening their claims by uh, articulating a mirror image and probably there is a danger in that in in the sense that this this may be uh, you know this this is, i think i think for for uh thinking with the broken planet and how to engage with it this probably the real question today is how do we think through analogies that 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 uh, that can develop a political force? And I understand uh, from the context that you are located in, uh, the high idea of healing kind of you know um, um, emerges as a very powerful kind of idea. But is this something that can be universally located over the world, or that can it transform? in different places. I mean, so one, it's a comment, but also a question. I mean, if you have kind of any kind of, uh, um, you know, comment about how this is getting operationalized in different parts of the world, this would be useful. I mean, I'm not sure if imaginaries um, can be operationalized like this. So, so I think um, the, the that they be so I, I guess uh, living in the context where I live, the word universal is always a difficult word to use. So so I find I find it um, difficult to to think uh, in these categories um, of universal rights, but at the same time, I mean, because this is the language that in a way has entered the conversation with what you were saying and what Julia was saying before. So, so I, I'm hesitant, but at the same time, I think it is our historical conjuncture is a moment in time where it's actually maybe very important to insist that there are things that are universal and localizable, if that makes sense. So not universalizable, so not they are the, the, the same everywhere and uh, rep. Re, Applicable, 
um, the way in which um, modernity wanted to replicate itself everywhere. But, but something that um, can be understood that um, wounding, harming, violating the planet is something that, that is ongoing around the planet and, and it needs um, working with and in certain ways that, that are very um, local and localized. So in that sense, what I hear from you, if I understand correctly, is that something that can be worked with everywhere no. may be useful again, but it should be worked in a very situated and specific way. But maybe I, I, I misunderstood you. No, I mean, let me just kind of ground it in, in the context of uh, Bombay, but also kind of give an example. For instance, um, <clears throat> when one thinks in term, I mean, you use the term wounded and then kind of articulated healing as a way of thinking about architecture. I mean, um, the other people have used the term architectures of extraction and kind of come, try to think through architectures without extraction, so on and so forth. In the context of coastal cities like Bombay, the idea that uh, architects have thought through land-centric imaginations need to be opposed with privileging water, so on and so forth. So there is this thing that is circulating around that you kind of privilege something that has been made le of lesser value in until now. Now, I'll just take one example of, or I mean, it's actually the condition of living in, in, in Mumbai. Uh, um, if I take an example of uh, Adivasis, the indigenous groups living in Mumbai, um, to think with their ideas of healing, and they do think with ideas of healing, in the present moment in Mumbai, does not seem to be uh, a strategy that works for them. So they use their indigenous ontologies and epistemologies in working with the change, but also garner new capacities in which uh, the changes that they make to build form have to, have to work with very subtle logics that don't seem to be oppositional because they do not have the they do not have the um, legal powers to be able to do that. I mean, if you extend this also to all kinds of wetscapes in in Mumbai, like the privileging of uh, water as against land in in in, in, in an era of weather change, uh, uh, which is being proposed. Um, it's actually, I mean, if you look at all the wetscapes of Mumbai uh, uh, and see what kind of uh, demographic lives over there, then there are uh, those who do not, those who cannot enter uh, the formal housing uh, processes, low-income groups, but which, which is also a caste question in this city. Um, um, who live over here work with very subtle ways in which to live with the waters that enter their houses uh, and are vulnerable, but to kind of think with just moving to the other side of privileging water we've seen, which is what middle income groups do, which is what the civil society does over here, like protect mangroves. Um, you know, think of greens, tends to weaken their claims to, to, to the habitats that they're living in. So, uh, so I'm, I'm saying that, you know, when you kind of think with uh, actually uh, the ways in which architecture gets operationalized in these landscapes, perhaps requires analogies that are more kind of fluid and not necessarily uh, uh, build a mirror image of what is being proposed. I mean, maybe recovery is helpful because recovery is is not um, oppositional, and it's 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 never 
clear what is actually necessary in order to recover. Um, and it's a process, I wouldn't necessarily call it fluid, but, but it's a process that can be very um, unpredictable. I mean, there can be fluidity in it, but unpredictability and um, I think constant responsiveness to, to what this recovering needs. And so, so relating it to what you were saying, um, how to um, find ways that support recovery from what has been caused and enable things to go on in ways that do not um, create uh, imposs new impossibilities, if I understand you correctly. Um, then probably we need to develop um, a very site-specific um, language in order to address these larger um, these larger questions that 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 are everywhere, but everywhere differently. Thanks. I don't know. I mean, I would just like, because Julia is also working a lot with, in, so sorry, I don't want to monopolize that, but she's working a lot with uh, indigenous um, questions around healing. And so I, I was just, it, did I understand correctly that the, the cosmologies or cosmographies of the communities you work with would actually prevent them from succeeding? No. And would you tell us more about I that? Would I mean, just to again, the uh, in, within indigenous groups living in Mumbai, um, the ways in which they live in what they would call as their garden as against the forest uh, works with subtle negotiations, both in terms of space and time. I mean, in, in terms of time, which is circadian, but which is also annual, but which is also cosmological. And there is an idea of healing embedded in this, that, you, that nature heals and you can take things from it uh, that you require, but you find ways of uh, allowing it to heal. Um, however, um, the ways in which, say, for example, the forest department uh, thinks about the futures of environmental conservation, which emerges from colonial uh, uh, imaginations of, of forest, um, translates into very, not only into big regulation, but into very small actions. Now, to oppose these actions, they cannot only rely on their indigenous epistemologies and ontologies, but they have to move very subtly with the colonial ontologies and epistemologies and mm -hmm. garner new capacities in that context. And therefore the mirror image becomes, uh, it, it does not mean that they lose or the indigenous ontologies and epistemologies vanish. It means that they move between both of them mm -hmm. to expand the claims to their spaces that the colonial present in terms of the conservation, uh, uh, environmental conservation policies of the forest try to erode in terms of their land. So it's this movement between different kinds of epistemologies and ontologies, both colonial as well as indigenous, does not assume a fix. Uh, we don't see a fixity in it. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I meant fluidity. Uh, uh, so that 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 is what my uh, point was. Not about a site specific language, but recognizing the the that one could be both here and there, and if mm -hmm. one is following certain kinds of, um, like you know, uh, just a simple thing, uh, the forest department in Mumbai is making a plan to resettle all our Adivasis on the outskirts of the national, what they call as the national park, what is the, the Sanjay Gandhi National Park. Now, some Adivasis left their houses, relocated in this rehabilitation housing, and realized it does not work for them. 
went back again to their uh, houses. Now, what happens in this context is that they, they're not sure they will be allowed to live in this place. And although the rehabilitation plan is not fully in place, um, it, it will come into place sometime and there will be efforts to relocate everybody um, on the outskirts of the park. Now, in this moment, you, every household needs to do two things. One is that collectively they, they, they want to resist this dislocation and resettlement elsewhere. But also they're not sure whether this would, I mean, they'll, they'll be able to resist that. In the meantime, therefore, you need to also kind of, you know, um, split up from the joint family because you, if you show two houses, you'll get two houses in the rehabilitation scheme. So um, you need to kind of, you need to kind of, you know, um, there are household configuration changing due to which build form changes, so on and so forth. All kinds of changes that are happening simultaneously. Now this may conventionally seem like a problem, but these are also adaptive measures in mm -hmm. the face of the colonial present that exists uh, today in the phase of the ways in which the forest is being articulated as a carbon sink uh, uh, for bump. Uh, th th I mean, we can continue this conversation, but I just wanted to let someone else who had a question in. Uh, Joel, can you let me uh, uh, dig in? Uh, yes, just give me a second. Sure. Yeah, she'll be joining us. Okay. Uh, Nea, can you just introduce yourself? Uh, sorry, my light is really bad. Hi, okay. hi, uh, Elka. This was uh, a very interesting conversation. Thank you for your work. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned, uh, you know, the space between capital and care is where the work lies, no? So um, navigating to extremes, how, how has that been for you in experience? Because usually people are either very much on one side or the other. And uh, the voices which are kind of trying to almost integrate the two are not strong enough, are not loud enough. So what has been your experience in that? Again, this is a super complex question. Um, thank you for asking it and 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 thank you for also making all of us think about how to inhabit um, the the space uh, between um, capital and um, and ways of caring that um, are still in common or let's say pre-modern or pre um, pre-capitalist. Um, so, so I don't think that this is an easy space um, to to inhabit, um, particularly not uh, when you, when you are a building architect, because uh, as we all know, architecture needs uh, resources and money and and finances and and all that. Um, so, so it is deeply dependent upon uh, what we call capital, not not just capital centric, but capital. I think examples that that have been um, tested out um, um, in in the context where I live is um, um, resisting um, forms of um, ownership and and work, working um, more in um, cooperatives, um, shared forms of ownership. Um, um, ways that um, land cannot be commodified and sold and is taken out of the market. So I think there are very concrete um, examples, and they have a lot to do with um, with laws and and with legal frameworks of how people organize around what is called um, land um, and housing. But it requires time. 
and um, and and let's say caring with each other for this. So so I think it's what I'm trying to say is that if you are um, a very under resourced person, it may not be easy for you to to access that because um, you also need to to have the the access to let's say the um, intellectual and self organizational resources in in order to do that. I mean, in order to organize in such a way. Um, but I think there there are examples. Um, the problem is that they always seem to be, and in a way, the discussion was there before. They seem to be small scale, or they seem to be, or they are um, fewer in relation to the still large scale um, capital driven um, development and and urbanization that we witness in many cities and also in so-called uh, rural um, areas of the world. Um, I was just in a conference in, in Bogota called um, Women Deliver. And one of the terms that I learned there and that I really liked was, was the word, um, in English, it would be insistentialism. So, so to insist, uh, to practice with insistence. And I think that's how I would like to answer, answer your question. There are concrete examples and they insist that things can be done differently and, and they are not um, utopos, they are not utopian, but, but, but they are here with us in the real world in order to become examples, um, not not universalizable examples, but examples to think with and learn with and from, um, I would say. I think what makes it so very hard today is that even the relation people have to their own care, let's say capitalism has infiltrated our minds and bodies. So, so when self-care becomes something one buys, as an extra treatment, like a massage, or I don't know, having your eyebrows plucked or whatever. But when self-care becomes this kind of thing that is always already a commodity, it's something that is entering into the neoliberalization of the mind, as I would call it. And that happens at all scales. I mean, at the bodily scale and at the architectural scale. And so I think um, entering this, this insisting that there is actually a space between care and capitalism that has not been commodified yet is for me the most important thing to do. And in order to tear things away from this capitalist um, exhaustion and um, extraction. Thank you, uh, insist, yes, that, that's I think for the next uh, several months, I'm going to try and insist. <laughs> okay, <laughs> me too. <laughs> Always. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll I have a question really to India because I don't know how okay. you have managed to establish the legal rights for the Yamuna River. This must be a product of insistence of uh, communities which have succeeded to establish this environmental personhood for this crucial river in the middle of a political situation which seems not uh, allowing for such uh, innovations. How did it happen? Do you know? How was it possible? It show, it, it, it's another empowering example of what is possible. And it is real because it prevents the poor river from pouring of millions of liters of toxic elements and of not purified water. So you are our example. How did you do it? Not the best person to answer the question. Uh, uh, but I mean, I uh, maybe I just want to sort of piggyback on what Neha was asking and sort of, uh, you know, what uh, Julia was talking about. Uh, so there was a slide in your presentation where you talked about, you know, how architecture history is sort of uh, very much entangled with the history of capital, right? Uh, and yet to think about architecture, right? And this is something that we see particularly in terms of architecture practices 
uh, which are heavily dependent on uh, you know lives and to yet think about architecture as a possible medium uh, uh, to you know think about healing and care uh, is uh, uh, you know seems like a difficult question. I mean, you sort of identified. Uh, you know, sort of the coordinates of it in terms of, you know, the, the, uh, the, the material histories, uh, and, you know, in terms of uh, certain epistemologies, uh, the drawing on, you know, feminist literatures and theories. Uh, but in terms of practice, again, I mean, you know, it's just uh, but like it, if uh, based on your work and something maybe, you know, uh, to what Julia is asking about also is that there are other forms of architectural practices which aren't necessarily about, uh, you know, building and construction, but uh, other forms of uh, building relationships, right? Uh, and if, if that is something that, that you've come across uh, in your work, uh, particularly I'm guessing in terms of curation, it, something that is possible, uh, but also in terms of the architecture field itself, if you've seen other kinds of practices that allow for such forms of you know, care to, uh, and I mean care in a sort of a wider sense uh, that uh, the conversation seems to be talking about at this point. Yeah, I know these are big questions and they seem all coming to you because you've sort of made these big propositions, uh, but I guess it's questions for everyone uh, who's here, yeah. Yeah, I think it's always, all these questions <laughs> yeah. are always collective questions. Right, I mean, in the right. sense that they can only uh, be answered again and again and again and again um, yeah. co collectively. I mean, I think one of the, the models that um, Gilika and I included in the critical care book um, is the community land trust model that was developed in Puerto Rico and then uh, taken up by catalytic communities uh, in, in Brazil. And, and it again, it's it's a, so, so the people in Puerto Rico who uh, <clears throat> brought this um, into reality, let's say, what, what they made real was was a law. I mean, what, what the architects and anthropologists and urban planners and, and local community leaders worked uh, for was a law that would ensure that the land their houses stands on um, can legally um, not be turned into a commodity because all the houses that had been built there incrementally since the 1930s as, as an informal um, city um, were threatened by eviction and dispossession. But they were also threatened by the fact that the financial district was encroaching and that the so-called value of the land was rising. And so, of course, for some individuals, it was very tempting to actually sell their land. Um, so, so I think for me that that is one of the examples that includes a lot of these things um, because the the river was um, which is um, estuarian situation um, was environmentally repaired and very often when something is repaired um, it's a form of green gentrification that those who lived there before are being driven away and are not uh, future, let's say, beneficiaries of environmental restoration and repair. So in this case, there was a large scale, long-term environmental repair work. Um, there were seven years of organizing, community meetings, uh, protesting, public demonstrations, deliberations with the municipality, um, building um, female, young female leadership um, in communities, and also uh, taking land out of property relations. Um, so for me, that is an example of, um, what, in a way, caretaking on very many levels, um, caretaking for relationships, caretaking for housing as living, caretaking for community as something that is essential and not an add-on, and also taking care for the environment that then is also, let's say, positive, um, a positive uh, effect for having cleaner water um, for those who live there. So, so I think uh, there are many such um, 
examples, I guess coming back to the question raised before, how do we connect these knowledges better? I mean, so I, I don't think that there needs to be one unified, huge um, um, group of people doing that. that that's, come, I think, impossible. But I think what you are doing at the moment, bringing people together from, from different parts, is just one of the many steps necessary to, to build these knowledge um, exchanges that that can nourish um, hope and that can be useful to the question was what are what is the next step i think there's not one next step i think there's always many next steps and and the let's say exhausting thing is that this goes on over lifetimes and and that's what i was also trying to say probably feminist recovery will have to be permanent so it's kind of this rebuilding, reworking, unlearning. And capitalism and patriarchy are super fast. I mean, so it's not that they are slow. They are reinventing themselves also all the time. So I think one also needs to learn together with others how not only to resist um, the, the colonial afterlives, um, but also how to resist the rejuvenation of uh, fascism and patriarchy um, today. And so in this, to me, I think to answer your question, maybe more concretely, collective learning is the most important um, form of understanding how we can um, um, produce care because care can of course be hijacked by capitalism and fascism and and all these regimes um very easily so so this is one way the other thing i wanted to say is the quote the capitalism quote is a quote by uh, from a book by Pe that peggy dima edited no i mean she she stated that and she did a lot of research on how capitalism informed architecture because she said that at Yale where she taught architectural history the word capitalism was never used in architecture history as if it happened miraculously without capital but I think what we maybe not have enough is is histories of architectural production that use diverse economies um, barter economies um, feminist economies that that are not based on the premise of capitalism and financialization and also ways of building that have to do with what was mentioned today already ancestral knowledges and and indigenous building practices that are never at least from my knowledge taught on par with western architectural histories i mean so so in a way thinking of architecture in a broader sense as a shared territory of complex histories, maybe that's a way of moving forward speech marks. Right. Uh, thanks a lot for that response. Uh, and I would like to illustrate it with this beautiful construction, so, which is called Meiji, okay. which was built on the smaller or the biggest island on earth which is the Majuli Island in Assam. Right, right, right. This is a sculpture by pra Dharmendra Prasad, who used the indigenous technologies of building such a house without capital, of course, right. and as just uh, Prasad suggested, as a community building measure. This right. was a wonderful sculpture. I had the pleasure to attend. So this was an example of uh, which connects uh, certain points in this discussion between Prasad and Elke as an example of architecture that heals, that cares. It's, it's, it's a circle. And at the same time, I don't know if uh, Rohit is still with us, but at the same time, indeed, further develops the indigenous knowledge because indigenous knowledge, it was so important that you said this, Rohit, because Indigenous knowledge is not something that was developed 5,000 years ago, and now it is exactly the same as it was 5,000 years ago, and that's why it is indigenous. It's not the case. It's precisely how this indigenous knowledge can be in the middle of the slums and can further develop itself. This is a big misunderstanding which happens during the exotization of indigenous epistemologies. But yes, this was exactly how... Uh, in this case, Darmenda Prasad further developed uh, these building uh, skills, 
and change them a little bit to be able to host uh, an assembly of desire, which happened in uh, the Majuli Island. Yeah. Sorry for this long illustration, no, Elke. No, no. No, it's actually been a great uh, conversation that that, um, that more than a question and answer session. It's been helpful to sort of, you know, draw out uh, these different uh, threads uh, that need uh, attention, uh, mm -hmm. but also particularly, the, the, I mean, something that emerges in this conversation is to, uh, I mean, look at the space of care uh, as this, uh, uh, you know, fluid, uh, open-ended uh, uh, space of different kinds of architectural practices, uh, you know, which may be uh, in conflict with each other and not are working towards some sense of uh, uh, healing and recovery. Yeah. Uh, so, at, at, you know, I mean, we're hoping that we can continue this conversation in a different format uh, as we go along. Uh, but I would have to end this uh, conversation here for now. Uh, thanks a lot again, Elke. Uh, thanks, Julia, for joining okay, in. Uh, thanks, Rohit and Meha. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and this was uh, a very really great conversation. So we'll keep in touch and we'll see you know, where things go from here. Thanks a lot. Thank you for the wonderful conversation and yeah. thank you for having and hosting me. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, so we'll end it here. Uh, thanks a lot for everyone for sticking with us for so long. Yeah, after a tiring day, hopefully. Yeah. All right. Bye.